Hi, this is Brenda. We're discussing the visual system for MOT 503 2016. First, just a little bit of an overview. We're going to be talking about the entire visual pathway today, and vision is so important for both our ability to function in our daily lives, including our balance, and it's also key to learning, our ability to take in new information. If a child loses vision when they're very young, they might be able to adapt rather well, but if we lose our sight later in life, this can be very devastating to our own independence, and it takes uh, an occupational therapist using some really creative adaptation to help someone with low vision or no vision uh, learn to function in their world. As you can see here on the slide, there uh, is a schematic of the uh, entire pathway starting from the cornea where we first take in light all the way to the visual cortex where we process this information and this is what we'll be discussing today. So part one, let's talk about the eye anatomy and what the parts of the eye are. Of course we're going to be discussing cranial nerve two which sends the visual information to the brain. Here we have the eye anatomy. Uh, first of all, the light hits the cornea. The cornea is the major refractor of the light, and it is avascular. It has no vasculature in it, which is one reason why it's so very easy to transplant. That's one of the things that uh, can be harvested and transplanted in organ donation. So here are some uh, a view of the layers of the eye. In this particular picture, I want you to take a look that the retina is the deepest layer of the eye. It's kind of pointing to the middle, but what they're trying to show you that that's, that's the back of the eyeball. Uh, and uh, the, the sclera and the choroid are the outside layers of the eye that are protecting that retina from the outside in. Here's another view. We're looking at uh, the cornea first again. It is transparent and permits light to enter the eye. One thing I want you to be aware of that it is cranial nerve 5, uh, the, tr the trigeminal nerve, which uh, innervates the sensations of the eye. So when you are putting your contact lens in and you kind of miss and you stick yourself in the cornea, that blink reflex that you have or the pain that you feel from that is from cranial nerve 5. The sclera is the rig rigid protective shell of the eye and then we have the iris which is the pretty part, the colored part. And in the iris we have the pupil which uh, will contract and expand using the sphincter muscle from cranial nerve 3 and the dilator muscle from cranial nerve 5. And the lens can also be adjusted with the ciliary muscles. So that ciliary body uh, or the ciliary muscle contracts and relaxes to adjust the accommodation of the lens. Between the lens and the cornea we have the aqueous humor which is the fluid that bathes the lens in the posterior uh, cornea, the back of the, of the most outer layer of the eye, and it's more watery which is why it's called aqueous. The vitreous humor is what's behind the lens and it is thicker, more viscous, that is why it's called the vitreous humor. The retina is on the very back of the eye and the macula is the very center of the retina. The retina has uh, more rods and fewer cones and the macula has more cones and fewer rods. The cones are detecting of color. They also pick up details for us. Um, but the rods are better at contrast and they sense black and white. The optic nerve exits a little bit superior and medial to the fovea. and it is not exactly in the center of our vision but it does cause a blind spot. Now we don't notice that blind spot because we're looking binocularly the whole time with both our eyes. We uh, can notice it if we either lose vision in one eye or if the eye doctor is testing us. The eye doctor can find that spot where we can't see with the optic nerve. Second part eye movements. How do our eyes move? We have all sorts of muscles that helps our eyes move. These are controlled by the cranial nerves and you'll notice these are on table 14.1 of page 330. We first have the oculomotor, then the trochlear and the abducens. Now cranial nerve 3 or the oculomotor controls the vast majority of the muscles of the eye. This includes the medial rectus muscle, the superior rectus muscle, the inferior rectus muscle, the inferior oblique muscle. 
also the levator palpebrae superioris, which is what controls opening our eyelid, and the pupillary sphincter and the ciliary muscle. Now some of these we heard about when we talked about the autonomic nervous system, so you can just kind of bear that in mind as well. Cranial nerve 4 is the superior oblique muscle, and cranial nerve 6 is the lateral rectus muscle. So the superior oblique muscle is the one that actually pulls your eye downward and inward. And the reason why this seems opposite or kind of counterintuitive is because both the superior and the inferior oblique work on pulley systems, so they actually move the eye in the opposite direction from what they think they that from what you think they would based on the name. So let's talk about these movements just a little bit more. The medial rectus muscle, the one that's closest to your nose, is the one that adducts the eye. The lateral rectus is the one that ab abducts your eye. The inferior rectus uh, depresses your eye. The superior rectus will actually pull your eye upward. And the inferior oblique, again, counter to what we think it would, causes extorsion, elevation, and abduction. Whereas the superior oblique causes intorsion, depression, and abduction. I'm sorry, that would, a, that would be adduction. That's probably a typo on your slide. And the levator palpebrae superioris, of course, elevates the upper eyelid. So our eye can move, eyes can move in many different directions. And one thing that we need to be aware of is when we are completing these conjugate eye movements, the ones where our eyes are working together, we actually have opposing muscle groups working. So if we're looking to our left, the medial rectus on our right eye is working and the lateral rectus on our left eye is working. And that is what creates the conjugate eye movements. Pursuits are the conjugate movements where we can follow something with slow eye movements at the same rate of a moving object. So if you're sitting at an intersection while you're driving and someone is crossing the street and you watch them cross the street, you're using visual pursuits to watch them. Saccades are rapid eye movements that are used to scan the visual field. You might use this in a very fast moving tennis match to watch first one player and then the other as they hit the ball. The vestibulo ocular reflex helps keep our eyes on a target when our head is in motion. So when I am looking at you and I turn my head, my eyes can stay on you even though my head is in motion. We'll actually spend a great deal more time talking about that one next week when we talk about the vestibular system. The optokinetic reflex happens when we move our eyes uh, more slowly to follow a target. This one happens when you're moving your eyes to follow a target and then you come back to catch the next object. So for example, if you are watching train cars, you're, you're parked in your car at a railway crossing and there's a train going by and your eyes slowly follow the train cars and then zip back to catch the next train car. That is an optokinetic reflex and you can actually induce it on someone. And we might actually try that a little bit later today. Then there is one disconjugate eye movement, which is normal that we do in order to be able to focus and that's vergence. It's convergence when we bring our eyes together to look at an object and divergence to look at an object as uh, it goes out further away from us. So a little bit more about the vestibulo ocular reflex. It stabilizes visual images during fast head movement. So I talked about um, how this can happen if you're keeping your eyes on me and um, you're turning your head while you're doing it. But another thing that we use it for all the time is when we're walking and we're in motion and our eyes are actually in motion too and in order to stabilize on what we're looking at we have to be able to use this vestibulo ocular reflex uh, to keep our eyes uh, steady. Uh, a good example of that one time that, that you might be able to notice it a little bit more is if you're uh, working out and doing something really fast like shooting a basketball and then turning around to run down the court you've got to be able to focus quickly while you turn your head or if you're a ballerina and you're spinning and you use that spotting where you turn your head to quickly focus on a spot and then turn your head again that vestibulo ocular reflex is in play during that time 
Now we can suppress the vestibulo-ocular reflex, which we would want to do if we want to turn our head and have our eyes go with our head. And it is the cerebellum that does that suppression for us. Remember that flocculonodular no lobe? That is what does that for us. And again, the optokinetic reflex is like you're watching the train cars go by or you're watching other vehicles go by on a cross street. We talked about vergence a little bit already. Convergence is like when you're reading a book. Divergence is when you're looking at something farther away, like on the chalkboard. So now I want you to stop the PowerPoint and practice pursuits, saccades, and vergence. As you're during, doing these, your starting position is your partner looking at your nose and not moving their head, and that is just to get them used to not moving their head. If you have a client who seems to want to move their head with their eyes, you can very gently put your hand or your finger underneath of their chin to help hold them in place, to help them understand how to keep their head in place. Then you're going to use a visual target, and I like to use the end of a pen, not the pen vertically, but hold the pen um, horizontally. So uh, maybe a better way to think of it is a pencil eraser. Hold the pencil so that the person is looking at the eraser, not the pencil then move the pencil in a slow H pattern. You want the pacing to be comfortable for them. You're not trying to see how fast they can go. You're trying to see if they can follow the target. And you're watching for smooth motion, range of motion, and do their eyes work together. If you see one eye sort of stop and the other eye flip into gear, uh, that's abnormal. If you see someone um, have jerky movements as they're trying to follow the pencil. That's called saccadic pursuits and that is also abnormal. With pursuits same, or saccades it's the same starting position but this time you're going to use two objects, so two pencils. I like to use actually two uh, fancy pencil erasers like little animals or, or uh, something that people can focus on and then you can say look at the frog, look at the horse, or look at the blue one, look at the green one and then it makes it easy for them to look back and forth. And you look for, are they accurate to the target, or do they shoot past the target, or not quite get to the target, or does it take them a really long time to shift gears? Especially with older adults, this can be impaired, even in a quote-unquote normal older adult. Vergence, again, the same start position. Uh, you will bring that pen or that eraser closer to their nose and then farther away from their nose very slowly. This can make someone dizzy when you do it, so you want to go slowly while you do it. It would be interesting if you can practice this on an older person, a person over the age of 45, because you will see that you cannot get nearly as much convergence with someone who uh, is, is past that magical age where their eyes have quit uh, ver converging very well. And that is actually called presbyopia. So stop right now and do those three, pursuits, saccades, and virgins, and then you can come on back and join me again. We have a few additional terms. First of all, we have a way of testing eye dominance with, with an eye cover, and that's explained in your book. Uh, without me being able to show you, I won't go through that here, but I'll have you take a look at it in the book. Uh, some other terms, diplopia, double vision, suppression, that's when the cortex can shut down one image. That also happens when people have floaters. They will, the, the brain will just ignore the floaters that are there and just focus on the visual target. It's actually a really handy thing to have if someone has a visual impairment to be able to suppress that, that uh, impairment or suppress that double vision. Tropia is when someone has um, what you might call a lazy eye and it's very apparent. Phoria is when they actually have a lazy eye but it's not apparent when their eyes are both focusing. It's only when you do a cover test that you can tell that it's there. So it's a little less apparent. The book explains those really well so I will leave you to look those up in the book to understand those a little bit better. Those are things that OTs don't usually test for but if you see it in a patient's chart it's really good to know because it means that they might not have good depth perception or they might not have uh, good focusing on a visual target. Here's a few things that go with tropia and phoria. ESO means eye turned inward. EXO means eye turned outward. 
Hyper means I turned superior. Hypo means I turned inferior. And you can put those, all those prefixes with tropia and phoria to get all sorts of different conditions like esophoria, esotropia, and so forth. If you'd like to know a little bit more about eso and exotropia and phoria, I have a YouTube video for you. That might be something that if you have some extra time during lab you can look at it. The video is several minutes long. You can skip ahead a little bit into about minute two and watch it um, to get an idea of, of how eye doctors will test for esotropia and esophoria. I feel like it's worth a watch because it'll help you understand what those things are. Not something that an OT is usually testing for, but something that's good for us to know about. Okay, we'll move on to part three. This is the visual pathway. So how does all that information that we're taking in through our eyes, through the cornea, to the retina, through the fovea, and then transmitted through the optic nerve. Where does it go from there? So we talked about this a little bit at the beginning. Once we get into the optic nerve at the back of the eye, we're, we're entering in some pathway kinds of things. So let's talk a little bit further about that. First of all, let's talk a little bit about visual field. It's important for us to understand that what happens on our retina is actually a mirror image to what's going on in our visual field. So when we lose a, a portion of our field of vision, we're not losing, we're not talking about a section of the retina, but we're talking about a section of the visual field. So for example, if we are losing left visual field, it's actually projected to the right side of both eyes. This is how the information gets projected to the brain. So the information is flipped and as you'll see in this picture, a person might be looking at a pencil point up. That image is then flipped in the eye on the back of the retina so that they're looking at the pencil point down. If that pencil were in their left field of vision, it would actually show up on their right retina point down. We'll talk about the, that more as we go on, but first of all, try to understand that as this information is getting sent along to the brain, it is getting sent along in a flipped position, flipped left to right, flipped up to down. So those cones and rods, the things that are taking in that information, cones are the ones that take in color, see cones, see color. Cones are the ones for high resolution vision. We have a lot more rods than cones and they are more sensitive not to color but to contrast. They help us with our night vision. They also let us see things that are in our periphery, things that are faster moving. But for the really good resolution and the uh, light changing information, that's what the cones help us with. So what is color blindness then? Color blindness is when the uh, genes for the cones uh, have mutated and they're not encoding things the same as maybe for you and I. Red green color blindness is the most common and because it is a X-linked recessive gene it is more common in males than females. I actually know a gentleman who is red green color blind and his wife has to match his colors for him and sometimes I've had him ask me what color is this? Is this red or green? And I'm like, really? You can't tell? And he's like, no, it looks brown to me. So he, he really can't tell. A really interesting phenomenon. And night blindness would be, uh, would occur when someone has a vitamin A deficiency and they have a hard time seeing in low light uh, because they don't have very much photosensitive pigment. This can be reversed somewhat uh, with oral supplements. Uh, it can also have a, a genetic background to it. Okay, so moving on from the rods and cones, what happens from there? When the optic nerve exits the eyeball, it is con called the optic nerve at that point up to the optic chiasm. After the chiasm, it is called the optic tract which then goes to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. We're going to show a picture of that later on, so hold on and you'll get to see it. And then from there, or, or a couple of other places it can go as well. 
The main body of all the fibers coming off the optic tract are going to the LGN, but some of them will go to the tectum, which is in, you remember it's in the, in the brainstem, to the superior colliculus, and they help with, with spatial localization. Remember that whole orienting the eyes to a stimulus? Uh, sometimes even before you know you're orienting because maybe you're in pain or maybe there's been a loud noise. And then there's also the pretectal area which helps us with our pupillary reflexes. So that brings in that autonomic uh, reflexive uh, information where the pupils will constrict and dilate according to what they need to do based on the light coming in. Some of the fibers will go that way as well. Of course we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about the vision fibers which are the ones going to the LGN. So here's a picture of it. So you can see that we have the optic nerve to the optic chiasm. At the optic chiasm a cool thing happens. The medial fibers, now those are the ones that are coming from the insides of both eyes, are the ones that cross. But remember in terms of the visual field, this is the lateral visual field. This is the information coming in from the lateral sides of things, the peripheral vision on the temporal sides of your head. Not the nose side, but the temporal side. Comes in, hits the medial side of the retina, and those fibers are the ones that are crossing in the optic chiasm. The lateral fibers, which are actually the, the medial visual field do not cross. They stay ipsilateral. After that octic chiasm, where the fibers travel are then called the optic tract. Optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, which then goes to the lateral geniculate nucleus, LGN, of the thalamus. And here's a picture of that thalamus. And you can see on the posterior part where the lateral geniculate bodies are, which contains the lateral geniculate nucleus, look how close it is to the superior colliculus. Right there at the base of the thalamus, at the top of the midbrain, almost just lateral to the superior colliculus. So all that visual information, although it sounds like they're going to completely different locations, are staying relatively close together. Also note that it's just behind, just uh, posterior to the VPL and the VPM. Do those sound familiar? The ventero-posterior lateral nucleus and the ventero-posterior medial nucleus? Those are the ones that contain synapses for the third neuron of the sensory tracts. Remember those sensory tracts from way back at the beginning of our semester. So just kind of putting together a picture for you of what's going on in the thalamus. Now we've gotten all the way back to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus and now we have these projections. We have a synapse and we have a projection to the cortex. Now the fibers here are called the optic radiation, also called the geniculocalcarine tract. Geniculocalcarine tract. And those lead to the primary visual cortex, which are on the medial side of the occipital lobe near the calcarine sulcus. It's also called the striate cortex because it looks kind of stripy. Again, anatomy, just to make you a little bit crazy. This is a really nice image to show you of how the visual fields project to the opposite side. So take a look at the purple side, which says left visual field. The information is going to each right retina. Follow the purple lines back. The medial side of the left retina crosses at the optic chiasm. The lateral side of the right retina does not cross. Both of those optic nerve fibers are coming from the left visual field. They end up at the right lateral geniculate nucleus and the right primary visual cortex. 
So the information in the cortex is contralateral to the visual field it represents. Let me say that one more time. The information in the primary visual cortex is contralateral to the left visual field information that it is representing. Here's another look at it. This time rather than having that band across the top representing the visual field, they're kind of showing you eyeball by eyeball. So if you look at the red, the red is now the right side of the visual field projecting to the left side of each eyeball. Now the left side of the right eyeball is medial, the left side of the left eyeball is lateral. So the information on the right side crosses over to join the information from the left side so that we now have all the right visual field information together in the left optic tract, the left lateral geniculate nucleus, and the left geniculocalcarine tract or optic radiation, and the left primary visual cortex or striate cortex. So that's taking it all, taking you all the way through the steps. I would like you to stop at the next slide because the next slide is another representation of this same issue. Notice I'm repeating it so that means it's important. I'm going to have you stop and draw it for yourselves. Use colors. Use one color like black for just the structures and then use a second color to show one visual field and where it ends up on the opposite cortex and a third color for the opposite visual field for the opposite cortex. And here it is, another representation. I'm going to have you stop and draw this at this point in time. How did your drawing turn out? Here's an actual photograph of the brain that might help you put it into perspective just a little bit. You can even see the olfactory nerve on this picture, which you can tell in this picture really well that the that olfactory is actually just a projection of the brain. But you can also see the, the cut optic nerves and the optic chiasm or chiasma as it's called here, the optic tract. You can see where it goes to the thalamus, which is right next to those uh, cerebral peduncles and right next to the midbrain. So you can see the lateral geniculate nucleus and from there that huge optic radiation that sends out that information uh, going to the uh, occipital cortex or the primary visual cortex. And they even show you where the corpus callosum is to give you a little bit of perspective there. Notice that lovely artery coming in there as well so you can tell a little bit about what artery might be perfusing this area. I believe that is the middle cerebral artery. Okay, so are you catching on to the whole visual fields thing? Really important. Left versus right, superior versus inferior. Remember that pencil. Pencil in your left visual field point up shows up on your right retina point down. So there are four quadrants that we're looking at. And here it is. So the, what they're trying to show you in this picture is if you look at the left side, there's a little, like a black spot, a lesion, okay, uh, that is showing up kind of in the inferior left lateral portion of the visual field and on the retinal field it's on the superior right side. And on the, if you look at the right side of our black square here, we have a, a lesion that's showing up in the inferior right visual field which shows up in the superior left retinal field. Now this is a rather personal uh, thing to me, really important for me to know because I actually have a visual deficit in my right eye. This is my left eye and uh, this is the pictures that the eye doctor takes of my eye. This actually uh, was um, 2014 as you can see from the date on there. Um, this happened, I had a um, pigment layer detachment of my right eye in something like 2007. Um, so I've been dealing with it for quite a while and just like that whole suppression thing we talked about most of the time I don't even know that it's there. 
These slides are actually in your study aids, so if you want to go look at them again, you can. They're there. But you can see where I've marked the fovea. That's the center of my vision. And this is what my right eye looks like where the fovea is. I have these two bubbles where the retina detached, and those areas tend to fill with fluid. Notice on the left picture, the one that has the green, the yellow, the orange, and the white, that those lesions appear in the upper right quadrant of my right eye, but I see them in my left lower visual field. That's where the lesion is in the right, but it actually appears to me like it's in my left lower uh, visual field. But I can really only see it when I cover my left eye and really focus with my right anymore because I've gotten so good at suppressing it. Again, here's a picture of a healthy eye. You can see where the fovea is and you can see where the optic disc is, where the cranial nerve is exiting and the white thingies are the arteries that are entering the eye. This is normal. This is not normal. You can see there's a lot more white in the fovea because it's filled with fluid. And here's another picture of it with a little bit more contrast where you can really see the white spots uh, that, are, that are in my eye. Again, it's not a big deal because I have two eyes and because it's not that I can't see, it's like looking through a bubble and most of the time anymore because suppression is so good I don't even notice that it's there. So just thought I'd share that with you because it's kind of interesting. So why does that quadrant thing happen? It's because when you get to the optic radiation, there are these things called Myers loops that divide the optic radiation kind of topographically into these quadrants. Now what they're trying to show you here is that uh, on the left side they're showing you like a superior view of that optic radiation and on the right side they're showing you um, as seen from the side and they're trying to show you that the purple one is actually the superior radiation that's taking information from the inferior visual field and the inferior radiation is taking information from the superior visual field. This is often called a pie in the sky lesion taking out one quad quadrant. Now I'm not talking about a lesion on the retina like what I have. I'm talking about a very tiny lesion to the optic radiation that can cause a, a quarter loss of visual field. Okay, and remember at this point you're getting information from both eyes. So it's not just one eye like what I've got with the spots on my retina. It's both eyes that are impacted at this point in time. It's both, well, both visual fields impacted because the information is getting interrupted in the pathway. So you actually have these lesions in your textbook, page 391, figures 16, 17. And this talks about what happens at each part of the pathway where we might have a lesion. If you have the lesion of an eye itself or of the optic nerve that is a complete lesion, you're going to end up with monocular vision. You're going to lose vision in one eye. That's a prechiasm interruption. Prior to the optic chiasm, in the optic nerve, you will have loss of vision from one eye. If you have a lesion of very specifically the optic chiasm, which can happen, you will get something called tunnel vision, um, where the medial fibers, which is the lateral visual field, is impacted. So that's if the optic chiasm has a lesion. Anywhere posterior to that, you're going to get some form of hemianopsia. So if you have the entire optic tract, have a lesion, the lateral geniculate body have a lesion, or the entire optic radiation, you're going to have a hemianopsia. That's called a left homonymous hemianopsia if it's on the right side. Now if you have a Myers loop lesion, that's when you get that pie in the sky lesion. That left field loss from, from information from that upper left field only if you have the lesion in, in the on the right side. And here's another view of it. Let's think through this again. So if you had a lesion of any of these, what would you get? What if you had a lesion of the eye itself or of the optic nerve that was complete? What would you end up with? 
What if you had a lesion to the optic chiasm? What would be the deficit there? What if you had a lesion to the optic tract posterior to the optic chiasm that was a complete lesion? What if you had a lesion to the lateral geniculate nucleus or to the entire optic radiation? What if you had a lesion to a Myers loop? So homonymous hemianopsia is a loss of half of the visual field and basically it's involving the same side of both eyes. Now it can happen on the right but it's more likely that it happens on the left because of the way that we are wired. So the left also goes along with loss of attention and, and we can tend to neglect. So if you have a right, a, a left visual field cut with left neglect, you can really have some problems because not only does the client have that visual loss, but they don't recognize that they have that visual loss. They, they've lost their left half of the world and don't recognize that it's there. It's really important to be able to explain this to a client and draw it for them because sometimes the, the drawing of it helps them understand it a little bit more. To explain how the brain works that if they have a stroke on the right side of their brain why it is that they can't see the left half of the world or are ignoring the left half of the world and they keep running into things on the left half of the world. Let's move on to the visual cortex. How do we interpret what we see? So here is uh, the mid-sagittal view of the calcarine sulcus and where it is. So it's around that area where we are processing vision in our primary visual cortex. Now our primary visual cortex quite simply detects the visual input. Oh, I'm seeing something. There it is. And it's responding to that motion, color, position. And then it starts talking to the other visual areas for interpretation of that information. So if we have no interpretation, it's like we're seeing everything for the first time every time and we're processing that information for the first time. It's our association areas that tell us, oh, that visual thing is a cat, which you might have just heard my cat meow because she just jumped up beside me. Then there are some other areas, and again, for purposes of the exam, I'm not going to have you memorize all the numbers and letters, but I want you to know the primary visual cortex in particular and, and where it is. But we have some other areas. Area 18, or the visual cortex 2, responds to orientation, direction, and, and color, and it is projecting that retinal information onto the, the fourth visual cortex area. Now, the third visual area also receives input from um, the first visual one, and this helps us represent the peripheral retinal orientation information, and it tells us a little bit about what it is that we're seeing, but not so much color. Okay. And the, the fourth visual area is telling us more about color and some of the large fields. Interpreting this information for us. What is it we're seeing as we're looking at things? Now we also have some areas that respond in particular to visual motion and to help us know how to adjust our own movements in response to that. So there are some really extensive interconnections in the visual area. There's some really impressive magic that happens in that visual cortex area in the occipital lobe that is beyond the scope of this class to go through. If you ever decide to become a neuroscientist, you might have an entire class in how the visual cortex processes its information. Just know that a lot of stuff happens and that it's not the primary visual cortex that interprets that information. It's some of those other visual processing areas that help us identify what it is that we are seeing. If we can't identify what we're seeing, that is called visual agnosia. And this sometimes happens with lesions, especially le typically lesions in the right hemisphere. And what happens is people can recognize, oh, that's a face, but they can't remember people by their faces. They, they have to 
um, listen maybe to their voices first and they learn to memorize things like hairstyles and eye color and they have a hard time associating a face that they see with somebody that they've known from the past. So we have some other areas of visual spatial perception that help us interpret what we're seeing according to where we are in space. This helps us with right left figure ground. Can we pick something out of a background? Can we pick out the notice that we want on a busy bulletin board or the item from the grocery shelf? I feel like I have problems with that even though I'm quote unquote normal. Form constancy. Can we interpret something is um, the same thing if we look at it in different forms? If we look at something from an unusual view or that's um, uh, maybe slightly different, presented slightly differently from what we're used to. For example, can you tell that a clock on the wall is telling you the time just like a wristwatch? Uh, can you tell that if we take a paintbrush and turn it um, on its end that it's still a paintbrush? Um, this is also where we get that uh, the stereopsis depth perception and topographical kind of that mapping being able to map um, and knowing directions so if you are bad at telling directions you might not have ever developed your topographical orientation portion of your brain very well we also interpret things about where our body is in space and how we aware are aware of our own spatial characteristics of our body when we have that unilateral neglect, uh, particularly noted in lesions on the right hemisphere, we often have um, people who just aren't even aware. They'll look at that, that left arm laying there and say, that's not even, that's not my arm. They don't recognize that that's their arm. They think maybe it's your arm, not their arm. If they don't even know that they don't know, if they're so neglectful of that left side, that they don't even know that they're being neglectful. That's called anosognosia, and it's very, very severe. Um, most of the time, people will know, oh, yeah, I, I need to you know, learn to pay attention to that left arm, and you can kind of train them to do that. But with anosognosia, it's really hard to even train them because they're so severely neglectful. That kind of starts us on some of the common deficits and diagnoses that we'll see with the eyes. We've talked about that a little bit all the way through. But what else can go wrong? Some of these things that we're going to talk about next are things that you mostly just need to be aware of as an OT. We're not the ones testing for them. They might have an optometrist or an ophthalmologist that might be testing them for these visual problems. And if you suspect someone of having these problems, then it's a referral. You need to refer them to someone who can help figure out what eye problems they have and what visual corrections they might need. So amblyopia and strabismus. Strabismus is poor teeming of the eyes. Uh, you will see this um, with the esophoria, esotropia. Um, all those things are basically further defining what a strabismus is. Strabismus is the more general term that says the eyes are not teeming well. Amblyopia is a, a lazy eye. Um, it's a condition where the vision does not normally develop um, correctly, which results in one weak eye versus one strong eye. And here's a really severe case of amblyopia um, with strabismus. The eyes are not teeming well, and uh, the, the child has not developed vision, um, functional vision, in that left eye. Um, this is possible to tr diagnose and treat early on. Um, sometimes surgery is needed to uh, get the muscles lined up better, and sometimes prism lenses help to um, get the eyes more aligned. If you look at that video that I posted the, the link to earlier on YouTube um, for the uh, tropia and um, phorias, uh, you'll see how the prisms can correct uh, vision. Myopia is nearsightedness. A lot of us have this. Uh, this is where the eye is elongated and uh, light is reflecting, um, light reflection is projected before the retina, so the, the focal point is not where it should be. Uh, it can be corrected with lenses. It can get worse with age, uh, in which case you need to keep adjusting your glasses. Um, there is laser surgery now to correct it, but that's a condition that, that our patients can have. Presbyopia, this is what happens when you get over the age of 40 or 45 and your eyes quit focusing as well as they did when you were young. So you can't converge as well. 
Um, and you tend to be more farsighted. Those, those are the people that are holding the book farther and farther and they joke that their arm isn't long enough for them to be able to read the fine print. Uh, it is progressive and it's because of the loss of elasticity in that lens. You can correct it with prescription lenses, most notably bifocals and trifocals, and people have had laser surgery for correction. Uh, it's um, also good to know that if a person has cataract surgery and they have um, an artificial lens implanted, that it corrects this somewhat for them. Astigmatism. This is where the cornea is actually warped a little bit and it can be corrected with prescription lenses as well. Floaters. These are often associated with aging. They can be associated with a vitreous detachment. These are debris that's too large to re be removed by the phagocytes inside the eyes and people will say that they have floaty, floaty spots in their vision. Uh, people have said that you never see the floaters if you have something to focus on. I can tell you from personal experience that that's not true, that if the floaters are there, um, you can always see them. You just learn to ignore them. Uh, and this is how floaters can happen. You can have a retinal detachment um, or just the vitreous detachment, which may, not, may or may not tear the retina. Um, on top of everything else in my right eye, I actually had a vitreous detachment as well that has caused some floaters and those floaters unfortunately are permanent. Um, I don't have the bleeding, I've never had the bleeding in my eye. Um, that is something though that, that folks with diabetes can often have and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Glaucoma is when there is too much pressure in the eye, uh, in the aqueous humor and it can cause damage um, or, and the vitreous humor as well. The pressure builds up in the vitreous humor and it can cause damage to the retina. Um, once the damage is there you can't reverse it which is why when a person uh, needs is found to have too high of pressure in their eye they need it treated right away. Macular degeneration is a central vision loss and it is a problem with the eye itself. There are two types dry which is more gradual and most common um, often treated with with vitamins and can sometimes be uh, slowed but not reversed and wet which is quicker and faster progressing um, and might be slowed with laser surgery um, and the bottom line for macular degeneration is protect your eyes by wearing your sunglasses when you're outside at any time um, in all weather uh, in all seasons uh, because the extra sunlight can harm your eyes um, and might show up a little bit later in life as macular degeneration. Diabetic retinopathy. This happens when people don't control, control their blood sugar well and even people who uh, try to control their blood sugar can still have uh, problems with their eyes and have disease of the retina as a result. Basically, they can have rupture, rupturing of the uh, small vessels in the eye um, that um, causes bleeding so that things look red in their eye and then scarring. And laser surgery can help uh, reduce the, the, the severity of the vision loss. Last but not least, cataracts, which cause a cloudy or a hardened or a yellow appearance um, in the eye and people will have blurred or hazy or distorted vision. This occurs uh, in the elderly naturally and um, worse with more UV rays um, and can happen younger if, if someone is exposed to UV rays a lot. Uh, mildly affects their color vision. Um, you can have laser surgery um, and replace that lens. Um, and like I said, that can also improve someone's um, visual accommodation um, a little bit better as, as well. Um, people tend to do most of the time really well with cataract surgery but occasionally you'll run across a patient who had a, a failed cataract surgery that didn't go so well for them. Um, so that basically covers our PowerPoint for today. Thank you very much for listening and um, sorry for the boring format. Um, you now have a couple of labs, uh, part one and part two of lab and you can progress with that from here. Thank you.